Hello and welcome to Getaway Day. My name is Gautam, his name is Mason, and today we will be discussing the National League Championship Series, which is now set between the Philadelphia Phillies and the San Diego Padres. Before we get started, if you enjoy the podcast, please subscribe on your favorite podcasting app and YouTube. Hit the notification bell on YouTube to get those notifications. Make sure you don't miss any future episodes. Uh, let us know your thoughts through the YouTube comments. Leave a review on Apple Podcasts or on Twitter and Facebook at Getaway Day Pod. It's really cold, Mason. How are you doing today? Uh, quite cold. I am currently wearing a blanket. I feel like like an eighty year old man who's just like sitting in his chair with the really fuzzy blanket over his legs and. It's, it's nice. I mean, you are a baseball fan, so you, you probably are an 80 year old man. That's true. I mean, this is an old man sport. Uh, I'm pretty sure that I yelled at some kid to get off my lawn the other day. You yelled so, at a cloud as well. I, I did. Yeah, okay. very often. Okay. Um, it's it's the Google cloud. I can't figure it out. I just <laughs> yeah, want no my, I just want my data. But oh, well. No, but how are you doing, dude? <laughs> I am doing good. Uh, excited for the game five between the Guardians and the Yankees that might start at some point tonight. They're currently in a rain delay in New York, but I assume they're going to play that game tonight and um, should be good. And the Astros might go to sleep, but I might not. Who knows? So I vote that you and I go and install a roof on Yankee Stadium tonight. And then they can play. Exactly. Uh, if right. we if we do that for them, I bet you they would name the roof after us. This yeah, is the getaway I'm, day roof. I'm on board. Yeah, that sounds great. Love it. Uh, we're going to have to make it retractable, though. Because otherwise it's not a real roof. So, right. yeah, clearly. All right, but we're not here to talk about the American League games tonight. We are here to talk about the National League Championship Series. Yes, we are. And it's the Phillies and the Padres. No one really saw this one coming. Um, even like a few weeks ago, I feel like of all the combinations it could have been, this is one of the most unlikely situations with now the Dodgers and the Braves out of it. Those were the, clearly the favorites. And then other good teams like the Mets and the Cardinals are out of it. I think... Pretty much everyone had all four of those teams ahead of the Phillies and the Padres going into this playoff situation. They're the five and the six seed. Um, but, you know, I'm here for it. The fact that these teams, um, it, we're, we're kind of going to go into some of their history, their recent history, their franchise history, just talking about how troubled these two fan bases have been and how unsuccessful these teams have kind of been over their histories, really. Uh, now one of them is going to be playing in the World Series in about a week and a half. Um, I guess, do you want to start with the Phillies? Do you want to start with the Padres? Where do you want to go? So I kind of want to start with the Padres. Um, so this Padres team is, uh, well, so the Padres franchise uh, came to be in 1969 when the, the league expanded we kind of came into uh, what's known as the divisional era. So instead of having just the the team that led the league play in the World Series, this is the first time that we had two divisions. Um, and then the uh, winners of those divisions would face off, and the winner of that face-off would go to the World Series. In that time span, the San Diego Padres team has been, what's the nice way to say it? God-awful. They have been god awful. Uh, they have 17 winning series since 1960 or winning seasons. Sorry, since 1969. That is it. That's including this year. 17. Um, they have only made the World Series twice, and they have never made the championship series outside of the two years that they went to the World Series. So this is a team that has not really had a ton of success um, at all, let alone in the postseason. Um, so the Padres making it to this championship series this year is a huge, huge deal for this team. Um, and yeah, I guess I'll 
I'll let you interject here if you've got anything to say, but I was going to start going on a tangent. Yeah, just to add on to their miserable history, um, from their first season in 1969 all the way up to 1983, they finished fourth, fifth, or sixth in their division every single year. And most of that those years, it was sixth or fifth. So kind of just like bottom dwellers um, as, they, as they got started as a franchise. Uh, they did have one great year in 1984 where they came very close, um, well, closer than they've ever come at any other time because they actually made it to the World Series and lost. Who did they lose the World Series to in 1984? Uh, in 84? That is a good question. Tigers. Uh, yep. Okay. And, and they did manage to get a win in that series, by the way. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, and those, those were the Tony Gwynn years. Obviously, Tony Gwynn's probably one of the greatest players, if not the greatest player in their history. Yeah, um, I think between Dave Winfield and, and Tony Gwynn, those are the two greatest in their history, and I think both were on that team, weren't they? Uh, that sounds right. Uh, Steve Garvey, Greg Nettles, Gary Templeton. So, no. They were not both on that team. That was the Goose Gossage Padres, too. Yeah, so so that's like a good point about the Padres that they haven't had a whole lot of superstar players in their in their history. They've had a lot of players that were kind of on the downside of their careers. They get guys that were stars on other teams, and then they come to the Padres, and they just are not quite the same. Yeah, it's actually really interesting. If you go to Petco Park... Um, so the Western Metal Supply Building is there kind of at the corner in left field. Uh, the foul pole is the corner of the building. Well, outside of the, uh, like on the, uh, what do you call it? Not the pavilion, the the concourse uh, out there is the Padres Hall of Fame. And so they've got the three pedestals for Trevor Hoffman, Tony Gwynn, and Dave Winfield, the three um, guys who basically made their name as Padres. And then they have a wall of all the Hall of Famers who played at some point in San Diego, um, including when San Diego was a triple A team. So they've got like what? It's like 25 plaques. But they only- have a whole bunch of the, the Cleveland players, right? Because they used to be the affiliate for Cleveland yep. back then. Yep. So they've got a ton of Cleveland players. But then really the only three players that were Hall of Famers in their careers with Padres are Hoffman, Winfield, and Gwynn. Like, they've got a thing for Ozzie Smith. They've got a thing for... um, Dave Winfield. Dave Winfield was actually their Hall of Famer, though, right? Uh, Yeah, but didn't he play for the Yankees? And I don't know who he played for for longer, but... But I don't know. It's just it's it's weird because like they it's a team that really wants to have a storied history. Yet a lot of their storied history is kind of reaching out and saying, hey, we had this guy for a little bit. We had that guy for a little bit. And I kind of think this might be the start of kind of an era of the Padres where they could almost say. This was our team. These were our players. We were good. And so that's kind of what they're what they're searching for in this postseason with guys like Machado, guys like uh, he's not on the team this year. And it was announced he's getting his third surgery uh, of the season. But Fernando Tatis Jr., um, some of these guys that um, maybe haven't spent their entire careers as a Padre. But this isn't the downside of a lot of these careers like Manny Machado signed a what nine year, $300 million deal three years ago. Uh, yeah, it's in 2019. So, so the, this is his fourth season. It was a 10 year deal. 10 year deal. Okay. Um, yeah. So a 10 year, $300 million deal in 2019 is he was 26 years old. So this is the prime Manny Machado that we're seeing right now. If this Padres team can go on and keep building success, he's one of those guys that would be their Hall of Famer. You've got guys like Tatis that's kind of the same way. Um, 
And I don't know, it just it feels like this is a team that they can be proud of. So now for sure, here, and I think it starts with I think we we can't tell the story of the Padres, especially the recent Padres, without talking about um, their current owner Peter Seidler and uh, their their president of baseball operations AJ Preller, who's kind of the man making all these moves to bring in Machado. He's a he's a he's a manic trader. Um, and he's incredibly aggressive in all the moves. And then that that only can happen because the Padres owner is willing to spend a lot more than a lot of other teams would, especially being in a smaller market than um, a lot of a lot of teams. Like they're they're not exactly like a, a huge market from a from a media perspective, but they do have that ability to spend and they've shown it in the recent years. Yeah, uh, especially right when Preller came in. Um, in let's see, he took over in 2014, right? The off season of 14, 15. Yeah, and he went crazy, right? Yep. So that off season, he went <laughs> he went out and got um, Matt Kemp, uh, Will Myers, um, sorry, I was looking at some of the guys that went back, and one of uh, a couple of them kind of. Yeah, the tra- trading Trey Turner. Yeah, yeah, Trey Turner, Yasmani Grandal, Zach Eflin. Like they gave up a lot of good guys. Um, yeah, let's see. So they got Will Myers. They got uh, Derek Norris, which wasn't a huge one. They Justin, signed James Shields. They signed James Shields. They got they Justin Craig Upton. Kimbrell. Um, they traded away Max Fried, Jace Peterson, Malik Smith, and Dustin Peterson, um, all for Justin Upton. Uh, they acquired Will uh, Will Middlebrooks, got Sean Kelly, got Brandon Maurer, got Craig Kimbrell, and BJ Upton, um, and Matt Whistler, all in one offseason. That is all one offseason to start a career as a GM with the Padres. And that didn't work out at all. We might... No, it did not. They <laughs> blew it up about no. halfway through the season. Right. So that things have changed like a whole lot since Preller take, took over, but he's always been kind of the guy that um, not, he's not afraid to do anything that he does. He's not like doing, making any half measures really. And he's the best at building a farm system. And that's kind of how the, um, the Padres have built this current squad, both through guys that have come up through their system and guys that they've like traded away to bring in other guys like, this off season when they brought in Juan Soto, they used one of their, they used a whole bunch of their really good prospects to bring in um, superstar talent. Yeah. Cause Mackenzie Gore and CJ Abrams were top 20 prospects in the majors, I believe. Not to mention the other guys that went back too, right? Oh yeah. A really young pitcher and James Wood. And it was one of the biggest was... prospect packages in the history of trading. Yeah. And then, um, and then you fast forward like one off season or one season really, and he went out, changed everything again. Got uh, Jose Perella, Daniel De Los Santos, Manuel Margot, uh, Drew Pomeranz, Jose Torres, Luis Perdomo, Christian Bethencourt. Um, during that next season, is kind of the first of the big moves that kind of put this team where they are today and that is trading away big game james shields for uh reliever eric johnson and a prospect uh infielder who you may or may not have heard of fernando tatis jr yeah so son of fernando tatis who is the only guy to hit two grand slams in the same inning at dodger stadium wearing a cardinals jersey We'll see if this junior kid pans out. But. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, I don't know. It, so, it, it kind of seems like that 2016 season and the trades at the deadline is kind of. Kind of what got us here, because in that same season, um, they got Chris Paddock, who, I mean, is no longer with the team, but 
kind of helped them get to the point where they started competing. Um, they traded away Melvin Upton and got Hansel Rodriguez. That one was eh. Uh, but then they got Josh Naylor, Luis Castillo, Jared Cosart, and Carter Caps, all for Andrew Kashner, um, Teron Guerrero, Colin Ray, which they then traded Josh Naylor and Luis Castillo. Wait, Josh Naylor came from the Marlins? Yep. Oh, I so, remember that. This is kind of exactly what you were talking about, though, with the um, with him just going out and basically buying and selling and trading and getting all these prospects and like all of these really big players in 2022 that are not associated with the Padres have been through the Padres. Yeah. So even going back to that first offseason, right, it's not like A.J. Preller didn't know that Trey Turner and Max Reed were going to be like good to great players, but he was willing to take that risk and, yeah. and go do that. Yeah. And kind of same with Yasmani Grandal. Right. Um, so yeah, this is just, it, it's, it's crazy. And then now who are they sporting on this team? Like I should be able to just list their team off the top of my head, but um, like we've got Manny Machado. We've got now Juan Soto out in the outfield, two big guys that Preller brought in. Um, you've got guys that came up kind of through the. I don't think he was a draft. Well, he, Where did he get Cronenworth? He brought he brought most of these guys in through trade. So Cronenworth and uh, Blake Snell, I think, came in the same trade from the Rays. Um, Josh Bell and uh, Soto from the Nationals. Machado was a free agent signing. Profar free agent signing. Um, uh, Hassan Kim. Free agent signing Brandon Drury this year in a trade, Trent Grisham in a trade, Austin Nola in a trade, um, Alfaro, Camposano, like all these guys come in trades. Um, Will Myers, I think, was one of his first acquisitions, right? So, uh, yes, he was one of his first ac- acquisitions. Uh, there is, there are two people on this current team that were drafted. By the Padres. And one of them you okay. actually just listed as a trade oh, guy, sorry. but it wasn't. Camposano, Luis, right? Luis Camposano was a second round pick in 2017 by AJ Preller. And then um uh where'd the other one go? Steven the other one? Steven Wilson, eighth round okay. draft pick reliever in twenty eighteen. Those are the only two guys that Preller has actually drafted. Every other player that makes up this team was a free agent or a trade, or a guy that they got out of um, Japan, uh, such as Pierce Johnson. Um, you had Has- or Kim Ha-sung for a purchase from the KBO. Like, it, he's the Jerry DePoto of the National League. That's what this guy is. Yep. It's almost like they're friends. Yeah. <laughs> they are friends. This wasn't DePoto... They were like roommates or something. For some reason, I thought <laughs> d- before. Where was Depoto before he was in uh, Seattle? He was with the Angels. Oh, okay, that's what it was. Yeah. Wait, the Padres had Emmanuel Class A. What? Yeah, acquired catcher when? Brett Nicholas from the Rangers for Emmanuel Class A in 2017-18 offseason. I was not aware. I wasn't either. I mean, you're going to tell me like half the players in the league were somehow on the Padres in the last 10 years. And I kind of believe you with the amount of moves this guy's made. Oh, uh, let's see. Who's another guy that I could surprise you with? Um, Rowan Wick, which you probably knew. I did know that. Uh, Ryan Schimpf. I I remember him. He had massive power. Uh, Estiuri Ruiz. He just got traded this year in the Josh Hader deal. Oh. Josh Van Meter. I forgot about him. I didn't know he was on the Padres. I didn't. Uh, that was in a. That was in a three team deal, uh, but they acquired him. So, yeah. Uh, but anyway, we're kind of getting off topic here. Um, yep. But yeah, so this Padres team is is a team that has always kind of struggled with their identity. Having a 
having a roster that was just kind of set and competitive and could go out there and play up with these teams like the Dodgers, who they just beat in four games, um, in a, a really well played series on their part. Um, teams like, uh, I mean, let's see, who's the first team they faced? The Mets. The Mets. The 101 win Mets. They went out and basically dominated that series. And this is a team that still has not finished first in the division since 2006. So this is kind of everything that's been building up to to this NLCS. The first NLCS that they've been to since 1998. This is going to be a huge deal for the city of San Diego. And they're the higher seed. So they're going to get four home games, potentially. Right. And it the series against the Dodgers just ended at home. They had a come from behind victory where they had a huge seventh inning to score five runs and, and beat the Dodgers. The place was just a madhouse. Petco Park was like it was on fire. It, it was crazy. So hopefully they can keep that going and they they get the chance to do that by having the first two games of the series there. And it's going to be insane yeah now before we get into talking about the the on-field product and how we think it's going to stack up let's go talk about the phillies for a minute and kind of their team history so the phillies are miserable and they've been miserable for an even longer time than the phillies by a lot 1883 to be exact (laughs) 1883 so one of the oldest franchises and i i do believe they are the losingest franchise in the history of baseball, they have over eleven thousand losses in their history. I mean, it, uh, it does kind of uh, help that they are one of the oldest, so they've had more games to lose while also still being around four hundred. <laughs> yeah, so they've only made fifteen playoff appearances in their one hundred and forty seasons. Just won seven pennants. They only have two world championships. Um, and with the latest one being in 2008, uh, kind of similar story to the Padres in that, you know, they've been mostly near the bottom of the league. They've had a couple of stretches basically in their history where they've been good. Um, kind of like the Padres, right? So the Padres were good. I mean, the Padres maybe even have less periods of being good than the Phillies. But the Phillies were really good in the late 70s, early 80s when they made three straight National League Championship Series from 76 to 78. They lost them all. They did win the World Series in 1980 um, and also lost the World Series in 1983. Um, And then the period more recently from about 2007 to 2011 where they made five straight playoff appearances and won one world series and lost one world series. So that was yeah. a pretty solid run. Yeah. And that's the, the Ryan Howard, uh, Jimmy Rollins chase Utley years. So the, yep. the years that kind of everyone remembers now, um, but then they really, really struggled after that last postseason appearance in 2011, uh, where you saw, um, Roy Halladay match up with Chris Carpenter in game five, I believe of the NLDS um, where that was the last time that the Phillies played in the postseason until their first game against the Cardinals here in um, the wildcard series. So, but they finished uh, third twice, second once, but then every other year they were either fourth or fifth in the, in the division. Um, so this is a team that has also kind of been struggling to find their um, their identity. Um, they haven't gone through nearly as big of a um, roster turnover as the Padres, but it, it just was a team that kind of under underperformed and just kind of in general for about 10 years. So what were some of the big moves that the Phillies have made during that time span? Cause I well, know some of the, I mean, I'll talk about the positive moves first. Cause 
they actually have in the recent years made some really good free agent signings like Bryce Harper in 2019, who's yep. their superstar leader of the team, which was they a also brought in 13 year, $330 million deal. Yeah, I think so. And then they brought in Zach Wheeler in. Would have been last year, I think, right? Was it just last year? Yeah, must have been. Or it might have been 2020. I can't remember. Yeah, it was 2020. So, yeah, brought in Zach Wheeler, who's one of their top starting pitchers right now. Um, you know, extensions for Aaron Nola. Um, and then trading for JT Real Muto and extending him. Those are all really solid moves. And that's part of the reason why they are they are where they are now. But kind of in that stretch from the last time they made the playoffs in 2011 to now, the problems have been um, like their bullpen, which has just been some basically like the worst bullpen in the history of baseball. Uh, for some of those years, w- one of those years in specific, I can't remember which one. Uh, and, th- and then they just never seemed like they had the secondary pieces to back up the the star players. And there would always just be stuff that would be going wrong for the Phillies. And um, they always had high expectations, it seemed like, and never never were able to track down, you know, the Braves and and whatever other teams in that division that they were chasing. Yeah. Uh, so, but this Phillies team now is kind of built a lot different. And and I think that's probably thanks to Dave Dombrowski, who came in as the GM. Was it this offseason or was it last offseason? I think it was last year. Yeah. And Dave Dombrowski, if you know anything about that man, uh, he's the guy who basically built the Tigers team that went to the World Series in 2006. Um, he's the guy who built the Red Sox teams that went to the World Series in 2007, 2013, something else. Um, but he's all about big moves, spending a lot of money, going and getting these big free agents, these big trades. Um, and, and he hates prospects. He's he, not afraid to trade them away. And he hates prospects. And so he comes in and... He goes and gets Kyle Schwarber. He goes and gets Nick Castellanos. He goes and gets, um, uh, shoot, who was the other one? Uh, I thought there was another big one this this year. Was there not? Um, I'm not thinking of it right now, but it'll sure come to me. But then he went out and started trying to get some uh, guys to help uh, bolster this bullpen. Brad Hand this year, even though Brad Hand is not really the same guy that he was with Cleveland, like that's still a big improvement over some of the uh, bullpens. Hey, that Brad they had Hand, in the another guy that was, that was on the Phillies. I yeah. mean, not was on the, the Padres. Padres. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, half their bullpen was on the Padres. I mean, Zach Eflin was a Padre. Brad Hand was a Padre. What? Yeah. Zach um, Eflin. Yeah. He was a Padre. He was. Yeah. Uh, he was in that 2014-15 offseason trades. He never pitched for the Padres, so I I didn't know. Uh, let's see. He was part of the... He went with Yasmani Grandal and Kyle Wieland uh, for Matt Kemp and Tim uh, er, Federovich. Federovich. So. But yeah, so... Uh, but this team is is significantly different from the standpoint that they've still got their big guys, their JT, their Bryce, their um, Zach Wheeler, their Aaron Nola. But then the other guys that are being put around them are guys like Kyle Schwarber, guys who have a lot of pop and they're not good defensively in the outfield. So that, in my opinion, is a bit of a problem. But eh. They got if Brandon the Marsh. Phillies end up winning the World Series, like the fact that they're going to do it with this defense that everyone's just been talking about basically the entire year since they signed Castellanos and Schwarber, that would be kind of amazing for Dombrowski. The yep. fact that he actually did it and he executed it and it worked. Yep, and and this is a, a defense that is sporting Alec Bohm at third base too. Like at the beginning Yikes. of the season, he was awful. He's yeah. he's improved over the course of the season. Don't get me wrong. But he's still he's still not good. Yeah, 
But so this is going to be really impressive if they can do this. Um, now, this is a franchise that while they have definitely had their ups and downs and they've had a lot of downs recently, they're still not quite as historically um, uh, historically lacking for success as the Padres. Because, I mean, they do have a World Series as recently as 2008. So, but going a full 10 years without the postseason in the city of Philadelphia. That's a pretty big deal. I mean, you see how Eagles fans are. They're kind of freaking out right now. They're like 6-0. and Yeah, and Phillies fans are equally freaking out because they're usually the same people. Um, yeah. But this is a crazy, crazy matchup between two teams that have just been so historically underperforming um and historically unsuccessful that really no no matter who wins this is a big deal uh-huh yeah and i was talking about the the kind of atmosphere at petco park that we're going to see in games one and two and then maybe later in the series but those middle games in philadelphia are going to be something else games three four and five that could that feels like the phillies could really use those games to their advantage and and just feed off the crowd like they were doing in the series against the Braves when they hit a couple three run bombs and and the place erupted. And I felt like that they couldn't lose at that point. I I'm not sure if I actually believe in momentum or anything like that, but um, it was, it was cool. It was cool to watch. And I think we're going to see a lot of exciting moments in this series, probably on both sides. Uh, Because they're exciting teams and and their fans are very excited. Yeah. And it's going to be kind of fun, too, because it's it's really beautiful ballparks that don't really necessarily get showcased in primetime all that often either. Because like you and I have been to San Diego a bunch of times now. Hands down, my favorite stadium I've ever been to. Uh, Philly is a bit newer. It's a bit more like Bush Stadium, where maybe it's not as unique, but it's still a really beautiful stadium. And neither one of these have got to host like a prime time huge series in a while. Like, yeah, you yeah, get is- Dodgers Padres games, but they're at like ten at night for me. So, eh. yeah, so it, this matchup feels very fresh. It's not the same old teams, and that that's what's cool about it. Yeah. Which, unfortunately, what we're going to end up talking about tomorrow is a very stale <laughs> matchup. Unless the Guardians win. And it's still going to be kind of stale. I mean, they're the True. team. The Guardians have had quite a bit more success than, than these two teams. Yeah. So, now I'm, I'm incredibly excited for this series. Um, yeah. So, what, what do you say we talk about this series a little bit more specifically and how they kind of match up? Yeah, um, let's do it. Can start with the starting pitching like we usually do um both teams have really strong starting pitching I, I would say that maybe the Padres a little bit deeper because they've got Darvish Snell and Musgrove um as their big three starters and then the Phillies have Zach Wheeler and, and Aaron Nola once you get past those two guys you're not as confident but the good news for the Phillies and the Padres are they can basically go to the top of their rotations right away in game one that it'll be Darvish and, um, and Wheeler for that first matchup. Yeah. And, and that'll be really fun. Um, I, I will point out, uh, you Darvish does not have the best postseason track record in baseball history. Uh, something we were talking about last night in our, um, watch party about, uh, Garrett Cole is he's uh, Garrett Cole has kind of been struggling with the home run bug in the postseason. And you Darvish is the same way. I mean, they're literally tied for the longest streak of giving up a home run in a postseason game with eight in a row. Um, so that's going to be probably big in this matchup is can you Darvish keep this Phillies team from teeing off? Because that mm-hmm. is something this Phillies team is very good at doing. Yeah. Especially, so. yeah, they, they did. They had some huge homers in the, in the last series. Uh, Bryce Harper's on absolute fire right now. He, he, he's hitting 435 uh, in the postseason with 10 hits, three doubles, three home runs. Uh, pretty much like back to his MVP form. Um, 
So he, he's like the main guy that that the Padres pitchers need to watch out for. But obviously they've got a they've got a whole host of other guys that can hit the long ball as well. So that's always something to keep an eye on in these in these postseason series. But on the Philly side for their pitchers, their two guys, uh, Wheeler and Nola, will be able to go um, four of the first six games. Right, they'll be able to basically pitch game one, game two, and then game five and game six. Game one, game two, then off day. There's an off day after game two, and then there's no more off days after um, game two. So, um, okay, so yeah, yeah, so they will be able to go one, two, five, and six because five would be five days off, or full rest for full rest for and Wheeler, then, and then the next day obviously is for full rest for Nola. So, yeah, yep. so, um, you will end up having to use Ranger Suarez and Noah Sendergaard in there, um, mm-hmm. which don't stack up as well against Joe Musgrove. And I, who would be the other starter? Would it be My Sean Mon- would, be, or would it be Clev? I'm guessing Clevenger because he's the guy that got the start in game one against the Dodgers when they needed the fourth starter. But he hasn't been so great and he wasn't so good in that first start. So maybe it's more like a bullpen game kind of thing. For game four, and, and that's exactly what the Phillies are going to do in game four as well. Cindergaard in that last game um, against the Braves, he started and he only pitched three innings, I believe, before they went to the pen. And somehow the Phillies pen was able to hold so, down the fort for the rest of that game. So what if they go a bullpen game but start Manaya? Basically sure, have him yeah. go two or three innings because you'd be stacking Manaya against Lefty and Kyle Schwarber. Um, righties lefty and Hoskins and in, in Real Muto, but then lefty again in Bryce. Um, so basically, the two biggest power threats are lefties. So Manaya might not be a terrible matchup for that, especially in in Game Four, depending on where the series is at. Would be a, a good move. So yeah, that's that's an interesting thing to keep an eye on, and uh. We'll see what how the Phillies kind of, or how the Padres try to counteract those um, big lefties, Schwarber and Harper, because their bullpen, they've got Hader, of course, who's a lefty, but the rest of their guys are mostly right-handed pitchers, the ones that they've been calling upon in the postseason. Uh, Robert Suarez, Luis Garcia, um, Stephen Wilson. So those guys have all been – actually, the Padres' bullpen in general has been insane in the postseason. I think they've only given up one run in 16 innings in the entire postseason. Dang. So that's a big reason why they, they beat the Mets and the, the Dodgers here. Yeah. So, yeah, so I think personally I would be – I, I think the Padres have the better pitching staff, kind of all all in all. Uh, mm-hmm. But I don't know that it's necessarily that big of a difference in this series. Like, like the the top end guys for the Phillies are obviously incredibly, incredibly, ridiculously good. Yeah, we could say that they roughly match up with the top of the the Padres staff, right? Yeah. I think the the biggest difference between the two is that number three starter for the yeah. two teams, and then I think that's exactly right. And then maybe your middle bullpen guys, but otherwise the they kind of stack up pretty well. So, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, how about how about the offenses? Would you give the edge to the Phillies, the Padres, or not? No edge, really. So I think I would give the edge to the Phillies um, just from the standpoint of uh, power. Because like we know what this team is capable of doing. We know how streaky they are as well. But this Padres team is equally streaky with their hitters. And guys like Jerickson Profar, uh, Josh Bell, Jake Cronenworth, they have not been particularly good the last couple months. And like we've seen some clutch hits from Cronenworth here in the last couple days. Um, and I, I'm not saying that those guys are bad by any means. It's just if this offense wants to compete and score a bunch of runs to help this pitcher or uh, this pitching staff, those guys are going to have to be on it. They can't rely on their seven, eight, nine hitters um, to carry the offense. 
I think Machado will be fine. I think Soto, he'll be on base a lot if he doesn't get a whole bunch of hits. But somewhere in that top six, the Padres are going to need to find some guys to get some hits. That's a good point about not relying on their bottom of the order because the two guys at the bottom of their order in the first two series were basically their best hitters uh, in Nola and Grisham, who, you know, they both hit over 380. Um, lots of times on base. Trent Grisham has basically played as well as uh, Bryce Harper for the most part. And you, you can't really count on that to continue. I mean, maybe it does, but yeah, you and, want and if, it, to be and if it does, you need to move Trent to the top of the top of the lineup. Because batting him eighth, if he's the only guy hitting, you're losing out on like one plate appearance a game at least. Um but no, but then you look over at the Phillies side and Schwarber strikes out he 30% really of struggled. the time. He's been struggling. But like JT has an inside the park home run in the last week. Um, Bryce has been insane. Castellanos had a really, really good game one and I think was still kind of being a factor in the next couple games, even though he didn't start out three for three with a um, whole bunch of RBIs and any of the rest of the games there. But Gene Segura has been pulling through for them. Uh, Brandon Marsh had that big three run home run. So like this is a Phillies team that top to bottom has had guys producing and um, not every guy has, but at least it's a little bit more throughout the lineup production. So that's kind of why I'm giving the edge here to the Phillies on the offensive side. Yeah, I, I, I'm going like back and forth on this one because I can see guys like, um, Soto just kind of breaking out and having a monster series. He, they, he has the capability. So does um, so does Machado. So yeah, I mean, I guess I'll give the slight edge to the Phillies, but it's it's just by hair. Yeah, and I uh, close. and I think this whole matchup is just incredibly close. I mean, these are the bottom two wild card teams, which so they were fighting to get in. They were. I think kind of rivaling each other to keep their their spot. Um, yeah, they were both fighting for the wild card spots. The yeah. last two, and and so th- I realize that's not really the best way to say that they're really evenly matched teams, but they've they've kind of had to go through the same fights, the same uh, situation just to get where they're at. So they know uh, they know how difficult it is to get here and how difficult it's going to be to keep going. And so you're going to see a lot of these guys fighting for uh, for the wins here. Like if guys are struggling. Um, that they're going to do anything they can to help their teams if they can't get a hit. You're going to see a lot of the Soto shuffle if he's not hitting the ball um, pro far. I you're probably going to see him try and use his use his speed there. I don't know, but. Um, this will be a really maybe one, good match. One distinct edge that we can give the Padres that's like the, the biggest edge, I would say, is defense. Yep. So Padres play really good defense. They got really good defenders in, on the left side of their infield and Machado and Kim. Um, center fielder. Apparently, Will Trent Myers. Christian. Trent Christian's a great center fielder. Um, apparently, Will Myers can play first base. If he's if that's the way he's contributing, <laughs> yeah. he can make some pretty good uh, off the base catches. So yeah, um, so I guess no one's really been talking about the Phillies' defense in the postseason. It, it hasn't it hasn't reared its ugly head. Maybe we see that in this series, and um, yeah. maybe that makes a difference. Now I I will say that after the trade deadline, their defense did get better uh, because that's they brought point. in Brandon Marsh. Matt Veerling came up and he started kind of playing a bit more for him in center. And so those two are going to be platooning in center field. Edmundo Sosa comes over for the Cardinals and he is not an amazing defender, but compared to, to Bohm and sometimes Bryson Stott, and he's D. a D. lot better. like major upgrade. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a team that did improve on defense compared to when we were talking about that a lot at the beginning of the year. Now, you are still putting Nick Castellanos in right field. You are still putting Schwarber in left. You do still have Gene Segura at second, who's solid, but not like he's not Tommy Edmond. He's not. Um, 
Reese Hoskins is very bad at first base. Yeah. So it, it still could rear its ugly head, but it's less likely than if it was opening day Phillies here. True. So, so props to Dombrowski for that, for improving midseason. Yeah, and doing it without big flashy guys, too. Because that's a very anti Dombrowski move. So. Yeah, All right, so, so I'll ask you uh, to just make a pick offhand. It's so hard. I am going to make my pick based on one guy and one guy alone, and that is the number three starter, Joe Musgrove. I think Joe Musgrove is going to be the difference maker in this series. I think he's going to go another seven innings, giving up two or less hits. I, I won't, I won't uh, prescribe a one hitter because that's kind of difficult to do. Two hits or less in seven innings in game three. That is going to be the momentum changer, and the Padres are going to win it in six. All right, Padres and six. I, I think I'm going to go with the Phillies. And I think it, the re, my main reason is just um, Nola and Wheeler. I, they've been riding those guys through the first two rounds. They've been basically like un, untouchable so far. And they're going to pitch four of the first six games. If they steal in, like another game in there somewhere, maybe lose one of the four games that those guys pitch, then they can win the series. Yeah. That's that's not a bad pick either. I mean, uh, both of these teams have kind of got to where they are by doing the same thing, riding their good pitching and wearing down the other team until they can get through. I mean, that's how the Phillies beat the Cardinals. They just uh, Wheeler had a phenomenal start. The Cardinals beat themselves in that game. The Phillies were able to put up some runs. The next game, they got one run off of the Cardinals uh, early on um, on the Bryce home run and then were able to just keep the offense for the Cardinals down. They did the same thing with the Braves where uh, the offense went and hit a couple home runs, but then these two guys just went six, seven innings and protected that bullpen. That is sub, uh, not, not subpar, but it's not as great. The Padres did kind of the same thing with the Mets. They were able to con- or contain that Mets offense. They were able to contain the Dodgers offense and in the division series, like, it it really is going to be a pitching like a, a defensive series, if you will. So I'm excited. I'm also very excited, and this this episode has made made me even more excited. So thank you. So um, now I just got to decide who I actually want to win. I think the Padres because they haven't won a World Series yet. Like they're who I'm picking because I think they're maybe the better team. But I think I'm rooting for them all the way through as well. I'm rooting for them for sure. But if the Phillies win, I'm not going to be upset. Either. Yeah, same. I mean, I don't have a horse in the race anymore. So, yeah, good baseball, please. Absolutely. Let's get six or seven great games. Let's do it. Awesome. All right. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if you join on Twitch, um, you can also catch the podcast episode uh, on YouTube or your favorite podcasting apps. Leave us a review and your thoughts on this episode. Who do you think is going to win this series? Uh, Apple Podcasts and then Facebook and Twitter at Getaway Day Pod. Also keep locked in on that social media. Um, we'll probably do another watch party later this week. Keep posted for when. Um, when we schedule that, uh, we'll, we'll let you know. And we'll be back tomorrow to do the ALCS uh, preview. Assuming this game happens tonight. Assuming this game happens tonight. So we'll talk to you then and have a great series. Have a great week.